welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. The carriage of my G. Burley watchmaker's lathe needs a lot of restoration work to get it back into working order. The lead screws have been badly damaged and need to be repaired by chasing them with a die. The thread geometry is very unusual, so commercial dies aren't available. The first step to making a die for a thread this small is making a tap, which I did in a recent video. In this video I'm going to use that tap to make a matching die. The most suitable standard die size has an outer diameter of 13 16 of an inch, which is just over 20mm, so I chose this 20mm ground silver steel bar to make it from. Most dies this size are a quarter inch thick, which is a little over 6mm. To face the stock flat I used a parallel behind the work to get it reasonably square. The stock is already about the right size and the thickness isn't critical, so all I have to do is face the two sides roughly parallel and knock off the corners. This would have gone a lot better if I didn't have the tool way too high. With the tool height fixed it cleans up a lot better. To face the other side I used the parallels once again. This should be easily parallel enough for a simple thread die. After cleaning up the part is almost exactly a quarter of an inch thick, which is mostly luck. I spotted the hole with a starter drill as it's better suited to drilling small accurate holes than a centre drill. The thread is a very unusual geometry, 0.6mm pitch by 4mm diameter with a 55 degree angle and a left hand direction. For full details how I worked this out, watch the tap build video via the link at the top right now. The thread geometry requires a 3.1mm centre hole, but my good quality drills are all coarse sizes. I used a good quality 2.5mm coasted twist drill for the first hole, then put it to the diameter with a very cheap drill of the right size. The cheap drills break really easily if I use them from scratch on tool steel. Now to try and tap the thread. The shop made tap has never been used in steel before, so I don't really know how well it will work. It seems to cut okay, but it's not easy going. I banked it out a couple of turns to break the chips and added more cutting oil. The tap felt tighter as the thread progressed and after a few turns I could feel something slipping. This turned out to be for two reasons. 
The first issue was that the shaft of the tap was soft and started to deform in the tap wrench. The second issue was the chuck wasn't quite tight enough and the parts started slipping. The second issue was easily fixed by tightening the chuck, but the tap wrench was clearly not working. I hadn't bothered to harden anywhere other than the cutting part, so the tap wrench had mashed the square shaft out of shape. In hindsight, it would have been desirable to harden the whole tool to make it more wear resistant. It was also a bad idea to drill a centre hole in this end of the tap, which has made it much weaker. The square was too damaged for the tap wrench to work, so I switched to using an adjustable wrench which could clamp with two flat surfaces over a wider area. Before pushing any further I wanted to check in detail how the tool was doing, so I backed the tap out and cleaned everything down for inspection. Looking at the die, the thread appears to be forming correctly and there's no sign of cross-threading. The dab itself looks ok at this point. All the cutting points look in good condition. You can clearly see the messy job I made of grinding the relief though. I kept working at it, clearing chips regularly. Using the tap follower makes it easier to apply torque to the tap without worrying about pulling it away to one side and damaging the straightness of the thread. Off camera I switched to a toolmaker's clamp which allowed me to get a really firm grip on the tap shaft. Eventually I managed to finish the thread and from a casual inspection it looks reasonably well formed. It'll be more obvious how well formed they are once the cutting edges have been machined. The lathe work for this tool is now complete, and the next step is to cut holes around the die to form the cutting edges. Commercially made dies around this size typically have three round holes in them. They basically define the cutting edges, but their shape and size is also important for allowing split dies to be opened up, adjusting the depth of cut. This M4 die has three 6mm holes in, with their centres 4.25mm from the dead centre of the die. I based my own design on the same dimensions and modelled it up in Onshape to make sure the geometry looked sane. Check the link in the description for access to my Onshape model. The holes needed to be precisely located relative to the centre, and I plan to locate them around the centre using the Proxon Simple Dividing Head. The dividing head table is exactly the same as the lathe spindle, allowing me to move the chuck from the lathe to the mill with the part still held in the jaws. To set this up I borrowed a trick from Joe Pye. Before I started the project while the chuck was still empty, I used it to set up everything I needed on the mill. To locate everything correctly, I first needed to align the axis of rotation of the chuck on the dividing head with the mill spindle. I put a broken end mill shank into the spindle and tightened the collet firmly.
I clamped the chuck drawers around the same shank, with the dividing head free to move on the table. This meant the chuck was exactly centred on the axis of the mill spindle. I fixed the dividing attachment in place and locked the axis, so everything was set up in advance for later. Fast forward to where we were, and the chuck can now be removed from the lathe and fitted to the dividing head. The centre of the dividing head is already directly in line with the axis, so it'll be easy to move it to the correct offset. As we saw on the CAD model, the hole's edges are interrupted as they overlap with the threaded centre hole. Twist drills generally won't cut straight if the hole is interrupted, so for the final diameter I would need to use an end mill. End mills which plunge straight down are available, but on my small wobbly mill they chatter a lot and cut very poorly near the centre. I needed to find another way of cutting straight down, and still deal with the interrupted cut at the edge. I used the dials to move the table so the spindle axis was 4.2mm from the die centre, the correct distance for the location of a hole. I then spotted the location with a starter drill. Then I unlocked the dividing head, I turned it 120 degrees to the next hole location and locked it firmly again. The spindle was now directly at the correct location for the next hole, and I spotted the position again. I then rotated another 120 degrees for the third hole. For the first pass drilling the holes, I chose the largest twist drill size that I could be certain would stay clear of the threads in the centre. If a twist drill cut is interrupted on one side, it's very likely to veer in the direction of the interruption, as the cutting edges are less loaded on that side. This would really screw up the hole. I chose a 3mm drill, just to make sure I had half a millimetre of safety margin. The twist drill starts very smoothly at the spotted position, because the starter drill point has an angle of 120 degrees to match the point of my twist drill set. I used fairly gentle drilling pressure, as the material wasn't fully supported underneath. Turning the dividing head 120 degrees to guarantee that I would be back at the correct location for each hole. The drill cut pretty smoothly, and I wasn't sure if any lubrication was necessary, but it doesn't seem to hurt, and I should help keep the twist drill cool. I planned to use a 6mm end mill to bring the holes to size, and the 3mm holes I already drilled made sure the centre of the bottom face of the end mill didn't need to do any cutting. This reduces a lot of the load on the end mill, and also makes it more stable while it's cutting. End mills are always held in a collet rather than a drill track, as the collet is designed to keep the end mill rigid under side load, which is exactly why I was using an end mill for this hole. A great tip I learned recently is to keep the plastic protector on the end of the end mill while installing it on the machine. It protects the fine points on the end mill in case I fumble or drop it, and it helps prevent me from stabbing myself in the hand if I'm too clumsy. The end mill sounded very noisy at first, but I discovered it made a lot less noise if I kept a fairly consistent vertical feed pressure on the cutter. The squealing seemed to be worse when the cutter was moving too slowly, which was probably due to the cutting edges rubbing against the surface. 
Fundamentally, this milling machine is just not very rigid, so it's very difficult to get rid of chatter entirely. It would probably have been better to use compressed air to clear the chips, but I didn't think of that until later. The surface finish inside the holes isn't perfect, but the cutting edges are the most important thing. They look well defined, and there are no obvious serious defects on the threads. Commercially made dies are often split, so it's possible to open them up to vary the depth of cut. I intended to split this die before using it, so I can control how close it cuts to the target size, but I won't do that until after heat treat, in case it makes the die more susceptible to deforming during hardening. Commercially made dies which are not yet split typically have a V-groove on the edge, aligned with the side of a hole. This can be used to align the die correctly in a holder or wrench, but it also marks the place where the split should be made. The die will be opened by tightening a screw between the sides of this groove, so it needs to be a V-shape. I placed the die in a vise and lined it up so the right position was at roughly 45 degrees. I have no reason to believe the angle of the sides of the groove are anyway critical, so eyeballing it seems good enough. I cut the groove with the same 6mm end mill. I advance the x-axis and the z-axis for each pass to keep the centre of the groove in the same place. Dies also need two detents cut either side of the groove for retaining screws that hold the die in place while cutting. To quickly mark the right location, I coloured the outer surface with a sharpie, put the die in a holder, and tightened the retaining screws to make a mark at the correct position. The detent only needs to be deep enough for the tip of the retaining screw to align with, so I used the starter drill again. Before heat treating the dye, I wrapped it in a paste of boric acid and denatured alcohol. Boric acid is only slightly toxic, but it's important not to get it in your eyes or breathe in the dust. I had no guidelines on the proportions, so I just added denatured alcohol until it was enough to bind the crystals into a paste. The paste behaves like a flux, preventing the surface from the steel from being exposed during hardening, and helps prevent the scale from forming. To keep the paste in place, I used a mesh of fine wire wall strands. <laughs> 
Both boric acid and denatured alcohol are nasty enough that I don't want to touch them with my bare hands, so I wore nitrile gloves. The most important area to protect is the cutting edges, so I made sure there was plenty of paste in the centre. That turned out to be way too much wire wool, so I cut most of it away. I pre-warmed the hearth while I was preparing the die for hardening to try and get more even heating. The burner uses matte pro gas, which burns in air a few hundred degrees hotter than propane. For very small parts, the silver steel data sheet recommends quenching in clean water, which has the advantage of being less messy than oil. Some metal workers recommend brine to reduce bubbles, but I'm going to wait until I have something that's easier to remake before experimenting too much. The wire wool strands burn away quite quickly, but the boric acid crystals have already melted into a sticky layer which clings to the steel pretty well. It seems to work just as well as making a cage from thicker iron wire. I prefer not to use thick wire as I'm concerned it will prevent the part from being quenched properly. The copper wire looped through the die quite predictably melted through almost immediately. I have no choice but to do the heat treatment outside, which means on days like this the wind causes quite a few problems when gusts divert the flame and the part cools down again. Silver steel needs to soak for a short while after reaching the right temperature to make sure it's heated through. With the wind gusting, it was tricky to find a moment when all the parts of the die were heated to red fairly evenly, but eventually I got the right moment and quenched it. Tempering by eye requires a clean metal surface, so I stoned one side of the hardened part to a bright finish. This bright surface should change to a straw yellow colour as the steel starts to temper, and for this tool that's where I'll remove the heat. Temper heat needs to be fairly gentle and even to ensure the entire part reaches the right temperature at the same time, and a traditional way to achieve this is to temper on a bed of brass chips. I rescued the chips from some brass drilling and lathe work I'd done, and degreased them with acetone. I set the cup on these bricks so I could easily control the level of heat. Fairly quickly it became obvious that the acetone hadn't degreased the chips enough and the heat started to produce oily smoke. The smoke was thick enough to make it hard to see the bright surface, and it looked as though it was also starting to discolour the surface of the steel. I ended up having to guess the right moment and remove it from the heat. After the temper I went back to the stone to remove the surface discoloration and bring all faces to a clean bright finish. 
I cleaned up the groove, the detents and the interior surfaces using a rubberized abrasive bit in a Dremel style tool. The final operation was to cut a slot to split the die. Now that it's hardened, conventional machine cutters won't work, so I chose a fine cut-off wheel and fitted it to my Proxon Dremel style tool. I clamped the die to this door hinge and clamped the hinge to the end of the mill cross table so I could advance it towards the cut-off wheel while keeping it pretty straight. This isn't the most professional fixture in the world, but it worked. Thin cut-off discs are very brittle, so I advanced the feed pretty slowly. There didn't seem to be any problem with the die heating up, probably because I was taking it so slow, and the fixture allowed the heat to conduct away quite easily. Now that the die has been split, I can try it out. This is the thread I need to repair. Under the microscope, it's fairly easy to see how the thread is damaged. Another part pressing on the thread points has flattened the tops and mushroomed the steel out to the side. The end of the screw is relatively undamaged and shows the contrast. I fitted it to the tailstock die holder as this was the easiest die holder to grip in the way I needed to for this kind of work. I opened up the die as far as I could be reasonably certain was safe and run it down a few millimetres of the lead screw. I'd opened the die to make a very shallow cut for the first pass. Any mistake I'd made while making the die would only damage the thread even more. Back under the microscope, the improvement is pretty clear. The point where I stopped is around here, and the thread is clearly in better condition than it was. I'm going to spend plenty of time carefully adjusting the die to get the best possible result, but that's a story for another video. The carriage for the watchmaker's lathe is getting quite close to the point where I can reassemble it again, and I'm really looking forward to making my first chips on the lathe. I have a few other projects already in production which are going to come first, but there isn't too long to wait now. My next video will be a race between some work on the Chinese lathe and a couple of small projects I have in the works, so check back soon.